So hi everyone, uh, I'm really happy, really excited to be here with you all today. I'm from Brazil. I came all the way to give this talk here at Pygodan and another one at DjangoCon US that will happen next, next week on San Diego. My name is Flavio Juvenal. That's my Twitter handle in case you want to follow me. I'll tweet there the links and code for this talk. I'm a partner at Vinta. We are a company from Brazil that works with companies here in the US building web products, mostly with Django and React. We do all the way from the design to the backend, front-end code also. So in case you need help with uh, web development or web products, feel free to reach us. There are other talks from folks at Vinta, uh, from Vinta at PyBay. You can check them on this link. Okay, so the slides are also available on this link in case you want to follow along. And the Jupyter Notebook source on this other link. So the motivation for this talk is that real-world data is a mess. Probably you've dealt with data like this before. Data where clearly there are duplicates. There are things here that represent the same real-world entity, but the values aren't exactly equal. So it's quite difficult for, to build an algorithm to figure out that records zero to three are duplicates because as you can see, the name varies, the address varies a bit, the city varies also, and those other two records are duplicates too, but you have difficult things like fourth like this and fourth like that, and San Francisco and SF. So it's quite difficult to build, uh, to build a general algorithm to handle that, but there is a whole area of study called deduplication, also known as record linkage, and it works by joining records in a nafusy way, using data like names, addresses, phone numbers, dates, to join records. We don't have unique identifiers here. If we had unique identifiers, we could simply join by them, and basically we could do a database join or just a manual algorithm join and solve our, our duplication project. But since we don't have unique identifiers, we have to use this kind of data to figure out duplicates. And the, basically, the duplication involves a lot of fuzzy comparison of strings. And we have algorithms for that. We have, for example, the Gerald Winkler similarity that you can give it two strings and it computes a number between zero to one uh, that represents the similarity between this, those two strings. Gerald Winkler is uh, used a lot in record linkage projects because it gives priority to the uh, leading characters of the string. And usually the errors are not on the leading characters, are on the trailing characters. So Jero Inkler is used a lot because of the, this, proper, this property of strings uh, on, of, that represent real world data. And if you use Jero Inkler to compare things that are different here, uh, different real-world entities, it will give you back a lower value. So we can use that to give us a hint if a record is duplicate to another. We can perform also physical comparison of addresses, and that trick to do that is to geocode street addresses, convert, converting them to lat to the longitude, uh, because geocoders can clean irrelevant address variations like a small variation on number or like a typo. And they can enable the calculation of geometric distance, use the lat to the longitude. Uh, we want to group together and compare things that are close. It's much more likely that they are uh, match, they are duplicates than things that are uh, far on the real world. So here I'm using the library geocoder to geocode those two addresses here. And as you can see, they are slightly different. And I'm just like iterating over them and calling geocode, geocoder Google. So I'm using the Google geocoder. And if I do that, you see that the result is exactly the same. I got here the latitude and longitude and the zip code for this address. And it's exactly the same, even though there are variations on those addresses. So 
the Google Geocoder was able to ignore the following variations. The lower uppercase difference between those addresses, the BLVD versus Boulevard, uh, it was able to ignore this abbreviation, actually to expand this abbreviation. It even detected that the zip code here was wrong and it corrected to the other one and ignored the Cupertino versus Cupertino. Here is a typo and Google Geocoder was able to ignore that. So that's great for the duplicating because we can clean a lot our data by geocoding addresses. Okay, now let's move to the real full steps to perform a deduplication project. First of all, we need to do preprocessing and to do that, we will use uh, the, our sample data set will be the restaurant data set. We've changed it a bit, uh, but not a lot. You can diff if you want later. But it, the restaurant data set is a well-known data set used by re, uh, researchers. It's made of 881 restaurant records from the Fodders and Zagat's restaurant guides. So someone got records, real records from those guides, put them together into a data set, and it contains 150 duplicates because some of the restaurants appear on both guides. And the data looks like this. You have the name of the restaurant, the address, the city, the phone, the type, and the cluster. The cluster represents the truth about this data. So records on the same cluster are duplicates. So as you can see, those three records here are duplicates. Those other three here are duplicates. And then it goes 881 records. So we obviously remove the cluster uh, and we will remove the phone and the type to make things more difficult. So we are left with this. So we, we can only use that to figure out the duplicates. The name, the address, and the city. And we'll clean the names uh, simply by leaving only what's alphanumeric. So we use some regex to clean it. Uh, we, will use, we will also remove the multi-spaces. Uh, multi-spaces don't matter, just a single space matter. And we are left with this, just like slightly clean, clean the names. We'll geocode all the addresses. So I did this before because it takes some time. And we geocoded all the addresses and got the postal and latitude longitude for each record. Here I use the Google Geocoder, but you can build your own geocoder. There are two tools for that. And now we can move to the next step. We have our clean data. Now we need to index it. And for the next steps, we use the library record linkage, also known as the Python record linkage toolkit. It's a great library to get started with record linkage and the duplication. So we have the cleaner records. Now we want the pairs to compare to find the matches. To produce the pairs, we could do a full index. That is, our records against our records. We will compare everything against everything and like use some metric to get the duplicates. But if, if we do that, we have 881 records. We will have to look into more than 300,000 pairs. And that's a huge number, even for less than 1,000 records. If you are dealing like with millions of records, you can imagine that th this number will grow too much and like it to take days to run your deduplication project. The number of pairs grows too fast as the number of records grows. It grows quite directly because the, the formula is that you have to compare all records against our records minus one because you want to compare the record with itself divided by two because it's sym symmetric. So this grows too fast. To avoid wasting too much time, we need indexing. We need only to produce pairs that are good candidates of being duplicates. And the basic way, there are other ways you can check later, but the basic way of doing indexing is blocking. It's to produce pairs that have some value in common. And the, the value in common we use here is postal code. We will produce the records that have equal postal code and to do that, we only, uh, we only need to import from record linkage index block postal. We use postal to block. We pass the data frame. We call index. And then we have uh, 6,000 and something pairs to compare, to run the comparisons we will see later and figure out which are the duplicates. So at most, we have 
this number of duplicates. Uh, actually, sorry, this number of pairs to compare and find the duplicates. And the data looks like this. The pairs look like this. So the record zero, it shares zip codes with those records here. Uh, the first ten, uh, it shares it shares the zip code, the, the postal code. So uh, we will only be able to get uh, duplicates of zero from this set here. Yes, we could be restricting too much. We'll see that later. OK, so now we'll move to the comparison step. We cleaned our records. We got the pairs we want to run comparisons on. And now we'll run those comparisons. And running the comparisons means we want to produce a comparison vector for each pair, each pair of records. So for example, imagine we produce this vector here. What this vector means? Uh, imagine that the, those numbers go only from 0 to 1. And this means that this pair of records have low similarity on names because it's 0.5. 0 0.5, .5, the similarity on names. Some similarity on address. High similarity on postals, because it's 0 0.9. And equal lat to the longitude, because it's 1. So the, the, this vector represents the similarity between each column, each attribute of those two records. And to compute the comparison vectors, we need, a simil we need to define a similarity function for each column. How we want to compare names, how we want to compare addresses, latitude and longitude. And to do that with Python Record Linkage Toolkit, we call, uh, we create a, a compare object and we attach to it the different uh, similarity functions we want to use. So on names, we will use Jaro Winkler to compute the similarity. On addresses, we use Jaro Winkler 2. On postal, we use Jaro Winkler 2. I'm using Jaro Winkler on all of them because I know that those strings, uh, the errors will mostly be towards the end of the strings, not the beginning. So Jaro Winkler makes sense here. And for latitude and longitude, we will, comp we will do a geometric uh, distance, geometric similarity. We will compute the distance. But we will use an exponential decay this means that as things uh, move, as, things, as the distance between addresses uh, get larger, it will decay the similarity exponentially because we only want to, to really care about things that are really close together. OK, now to compute the comparison vectors, we just need to call compute over the pairs that we got from the indexer on the data frame. And we get something like this. Is for, so for this, the pair 0, 1, we have those similarities. For pair 0, 2, we have this, those other similarities. And there it goes. Now, with our comparison vectors, with the similarity between our records, we will explore different ways to classify them as matches or no matches. And that's the classification step. The first type of classification we will try is threshold-based classification. So a simple way to classify comparison vectors as matches or no matches is to compute a weighted average over the vectors and get a score. So here we use the weight 50 for name, 30 for address, 10 for postal, and 20 for latitude and longitude. We compute, we compute the weighted average and we get this score here. We know from the data that records 0, 1, and 2 are duplicates. So we will just perhaps try the threshold 0 0.9. And let's see how this performs. So if we use the threshold 0 0.9, we get this as, so this is the data. We know that 0, 1, and 2 are duplicates, and we will Oh, just a second, sorry. And if we filter our comparison vectors from 0 0.9, that's what we get. And this seems right, because 0, 1, and 2 are duplicates. 3 and 4 are duplicates, and they are appearing here. And since we have the 
true match status on the cluster column, we can evaluate how well our threshold basic classification did. And I can compute the golden pairs, the pairs that represent the truth about this data. And I can figure out the true positives, the false positives, and the false negatives that the threshold classification found. So the threshold basic classification found 128 true positives, things that are duplicates, and it found. It found two false positives. This classification method thinks two records are, two pairs <coughs> are duplicates, but they aren't. And 22 false negatives, things that are duplicates, pairs that are duplicates, but it couldn't find. So we got a small number of false positives. Those are the false positives we found. And as you can see here, even humans could think that those are duplicates, because those are really hard cases. The only thing that changes here is cafe versus dining room, and here is the cafe. So it's quite difficult. On the other hand, we got a lot of false negatives. We missed a lot of matches. Things that are like clearly duplicates, the threshold basic classification couldn't find these as duplicates. Probably because we didn't even block this together because the poster is different, but we'll see. We set the weights and the threshold by guessing. Could you do any better? Yes, we could try supervised classification. Instead of trying to guess weights and thresholds, we can train a classifier, a machine learning classifier, to learn how to classify matches and no matches based on some training data we provide. So this is supervised. We will provide training data to train a classifier and to have it classifying as matches and no matches. So this is the training data we produced Okay, so we got some hand-on clusters here, and we will train a classifier with that. The classifier, sorry, before we need to pre-process our training data to have it the same way as the data we are using for matching. So we pre-process it, assign no symbols, and get the postal lot to longitude. And then we'll feed a support vector machine classifier. Because SVMs are good for the duplication, they are resilient to noise, they can handle correlated features, like address and latitude and longitude, and they are robust to imbalanced training sets. And imbalanced training sets is very natural on the duplication projects because you, have, you tend to have much more no, uh, no matches than matches because the number of pairs, you are dealing with pairs. You are, we aren't dealing with single records. So you have much more non matches than matches. And you can check the source for that later is a PhD thesis. And OK, so we will, uh, Record Linkage Toolkit comes built in with the SVM classifier. So you fit it with the training vectors we computed. And let's check how it performed. It performed better than the threshold basic classification. OK, so we got 133 true positives, two false positives again, and 17 false negatives. That's OK, but we can do better. The thing is, there are other classifiers from Record Linkage Library we could try. But it's very difficult to build a good training set that takes in account all important cases of matches and no matches. And we are not even sure if we chose the best index rules. Like we saw, we chose like to index by postal. But we are missing some matches, because some matches don't have common postal codes. So we could be missing matches due blocking, or we could be introducing mismatches because we are blocking things together, and they shouldn't be blocked together. Uh, the classifier isn't being able to classify them as no matches because they are blocked together, and the classifier is very forgiving. And the alternative to all of that, all of that uncertainty, is active learning classification. Active learning methods try to identify training examples that lead to maximal accuracy improvements that to train both the optimal classifier weights and the optimal indexing blocking rules. So we can learn both the best weights for the classifier and also we can learn indexing blocking rules. And there's our library for that on Python called dedupe. You need just to declare the data you have I'm declaring here that I have the name and I want to use Jerry Winkler on it. And I have lot to the launch to them. I want to use exponential decay lot to launch to. So basically I'm doing the same I did before, but with the dupe. 
And now we instantiate the deduper here, just instantiating it with this, uh, those fields. And when I run it, I want to run it here because it takes some time to run. But when I run it, it asks me to label examples. So it asks, it asks me if those two records here are duplicates or not, and then I say no. And then it goes on, I say no, no. And then I say, let's see, I yes. I say yes for this, those two. And then as I train it, it gets learning predicates. Predicates are blocking rules. And first it learns a bad blocking rule. It tries to block by the whole field of name, only things that have common name. But as it gets going, it learns better uh, predicates like the fingerprint of the name, so like a slug of the name. So it, it learns from data we provide. And it asks us about the pairs that it's most unsure about. So it's getting better as it learns. We are building the best training set we can, we, it could get. And those are the predicates it learned. Uh, it gets a grid on the latitude and longitude, gets a one gram fingerprint on the name, gets the first integer of the address is the number. So it makes sense. What, the way it's indexing our data makes sense. And this means we probably trained it enough. And I just run fast here. Uh, I'll just see how it performed. And it performed much better than the other methods. It got 141 true positives, and that's great. Only three false positives and nine false negatives. That's awesome. However, we like missed one step that is clustering. Using the threshold or the SVM, we got the matching pairs. We got the pairs. But what the dupe really returned to us was where the clusters of matches. It returned this. It returned that 0, 1, and 2 are just one thing. 3, 4, and 5 are another thing. So that's what we really want. We don't want the pairs that match. We want the clusters. So we need to go one step further. That, that, and, and the record linkage toolkit doesn't go into that step, but the dupe does. And what's happening here? Why do we have to cluster? Because the, the matching and no matching status isn't transitive. It can happen that we have records A, B, and C. A and B match. B and C match. But A and C, it's not a match. That doesn't make sense. It's like a triangle. You have to get all the edges. It doesn't make sense to have only two edges. And the solution for that is clustering to compute the transitive closure uh, of those of our pairs. So using some private methods from dedupe, we can get the unclustered pairs. And I'll just run fast here to show you what's happening. What's happening is that the unclustered pairs are different from the clustered pairs because the clustering process changes the matching status. It's like this. You have, <clears throat> you have the truth that is this, this one. Sorry, it's not showing the edges. But those three are connected. That's the true status. And what the unclustered got is that this one matches this. This other one matches this one. But those two doesn't match. And if we compute the clustering, what clustering does is actually getting all of those three together. The clustering figures out that this edge here is missing, so it groups it together. It could happen that the clustering didn't found, find exactly this result. The clustering could like just get one edge instead of, uh, instead of the three edges. So the clustering basically disambiguates the result. And by disambiguating the result, it can get more matches or less matches. Depends on the data and the similarities and everything. So it can both improve or worsen the result, but you need to do that. Otherwise, you have an ambiguous result. And that's it. You can check the next steps on the slides uh, later, like things you can learn more. Uh, there's more resources you can learn about that. And that's it. I'm running offline. Thank you very much. Yeah. Can you go back to uh, the slide with the link to your 
Yeah, yeah. I'll go back here. <clears throat> so you, you folks can ask questions for me during the conference, and the slides and the sources are available here. There is a binder link, so you don't have any, you don't even have to install it on your machine. You can just click those, this binder link and you have a Jupyter notebook running online for you with this code. Thank you.